So, if you would, please turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Peter. 1 Peter, as we uh, we begin to look at this, I, I, I be honest, I wanted to be looking in uh, Micah, but uh, just something continually brought me back to Peter. Uh, so that's where we're going to be at, at least for the foreseeable future. And here we find... 1 Peter 1 and, two, uh, 1 and 1, 2 says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of of the Spirit for the obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Dear Lord, most gracious Heavenly Father, as we come before you right now, Father, I just ask that you would open up uh, this word to us. Help us to see your word for what it is. Father, help us to have your word applied to our lives. And Father, if there be something here tonight that does send conviction, then I simply ask that you would take us and wash us with your mighty word. For it's your name we ask and humbly pray. Amen. So as we look here, uh, you know, we're looking at Peter. Now, uh, when you look at all of these, uh, you'll find that at the Council of Nicaea, when we talk about uh, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, and Jude, uh, there was really absolutely no question that 1 Peter was written by Peter. Now, they take that from the word of a guy by the name of Polycarp, who was a Christian uh, who came to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and was a pastor uh, there at uh, Smyrna. Uh, but he came to uh, his, his time of realization who God was and his submission to God uh, roughly about five years after Peter's death uh, under the hands of uh, John the Apostle. And with that, we, we find in all of his writings that it's over and over and over again he will quote uh, virtually all of the New Testament, all the letters that he wrote including uh, 1 Peter. But as we look here, we, I want to look at just for a little bit uh, at Peter and what he's talking about here in this text. We find that, of course, uh, it is written by Peter. Now, Second Peter, they, they did have a few questions, but they ultimately said that it was written by Peter with enough proof, same for Jude. Uh, but 1 Peter, as we look there, we know that Peter is writing this. Now, if you look, you'll find... Why? How can he do this? I thought he was a, a backwoods fisherman uh, from the Galilee area. How did he be able to do all this? We remember, if we'll look in Acts, that he was supposed to be unlearned, or he basically he's not. He's pretty much illiterate, is what they basically were saying of him there at the Sanhedrin in Acts. But we know that uh, in this, that this is written by Peter. Now. When we look at Peter, we need to understand who Peter is by this point. We understand that Peter, first off, is a man that has lived in the redemption of God. As we look at that living by the redemption of God, I've automatically, I think back, because I love the, uh, the gospel of Mark uh, so, so much. One, because it's short. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, guys, we usually don't like to read, right? Right? So it's short gospel. Why not just read Mark? But when you look in Mark uh, chapter 16, and the ladies have came, they're going to uh, go and anoint Jesus' body because he's going to begin to stink. And they, uh, they're going along, and as they're going along, they say, how are we going to get the rock out in front of him? You know, it's sealed, and we got all this going on, but they don't worry about any of that. That sort of should help you with, uh, don't worry about the other things. Worry about what God has called you to do. And so as they get there, they find the rock's gone. The, uh, the soldiers are uh, struck as dumb. 
uh, and they go in and they find there's a, an angel there. Why are you seeking the living among the dead? He's not here. He is risen. Uh, then you find in verse 6 and verse 7, and there in verse 6 it says, Go tell the disciples and tell Peter that he is going to meet them. So we find uh, that in this, uh, we find the call to redemption. How many of us in our lives have we needed a call of redemption? That we have done so many things or we've done maybe one major thing that we continually have to deal with. We continually uh, may feel shame or sorrow over. Uh, but in all these cases, we need to understand that there is redemption even in the midst of all of that that you probably, you may be, and you know that you have done. This redemption is in the very love of the Lord. You see, if, uh, if because he had denied Christ three times, if because he had cursed himself and cursed God before he died, that meant that he thought that he was done, he was doomed, there's nothing more he could do. But yet we find redemption in the very fact that Christ loved him enough that he gave him that again. We find, if we remember uh, John 21, John 21, we find uh, he's sitting there at a coal fire. He's um, cooking some fish for breakfast. I can do chicken for breakfast, but I'm not sure about fish, Brother Kenneth. But, but there he is, and he says, Peter, do you love me? Well, of course I love you. Well, Peter, do you love me? You know that I love you. Peter, do you love me more than these? Above all things, Lord, you know that I love you. And then from there, he begins to give him his directive for the rest of his life. His directive was not to go back a fishing. His directive was not just to be uh, a little insignificant. No, he had a major job to do which was to feed the lamb and the sheep of God. You see, he had this life of redemption that then was shown uh, there in Acts 2. In Acts 2, we find verses 38 through roughly 45. Uh, we find, of course, a five-minute sermon uh, uh, that's recorded by Luke. Five-minute sermon, and in that he says that if you will confess and believe, you shall have forgiveness. You see, that's what it takes for redemption. It doesn't take, well, uh, I, I did all this, so I just need to run away and not do anything ever again. No. What it takes is simply to confess, be cleansed, and continue on living a life that is in the redemption of the Lord. Where is it maybe that you could use redemption? Where is it maybe that you need to show that grace, show that mercy, show that redemption to someone else? We find also with Brother Peter that, uh, that he was a man that not only lived in, uh, in this redemption, but he was a man that lived in the service to Christ. How many times did he take a beating for Christ? How many times was he jailed? For Christ. How many times did he live a life that was solely in submission and service to his king? We find that he, he had the, uh, the service to the church. Remember, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. We look here, and he talks about the pilgrims, uh, the dispersion. And if you look at all of those names, I, I did a, a really good geeky study today, finding every, where each and every one of these were, what they were known for, how they were at this time in history, what they became. And honestly, it's just different spots in Turkey. The first time you find them is in Acts chapter 2, because those men were there. But he, was a, he served the church. Now, let me ask you this question. Where is it that we... You, I, can serve the church. You see, 
when we get to this point of service, it's not about what we get out of it. It's about what we can give it. The best example of that I can give is going back to uh, Ephesians chapter 5 and the, uh, the declaration that Paul gives about uh, husbands and wives. Husbands, love your spouse, your wife, as Christ loved the church. Serve her the way Christ served the church. Well, how did, how did uh, the Lord serve the church? He served her sacrificially. He gave everything he had for her. So what should we do if we are to live a life of service unto our king, other than to serve him and give him every single thing we have and really and honestly not expect anything back in return? He also served his family. Now, this one is one uh, that blew my mind when, uh, when I found this. You ever love those where you're in the midst of Bible study and all of a sudden you see something you've never saw before and it blows your mind? This one blew my mind. 1 Corinthians, you might want to write this down. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 5 says, Do we have no right to take along a believing wife, a believing wife? As do also the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord, and Cephas. So not only did he serve the Lord, but we also find that he served the church. That was his directive. But he also had to serve his family. You know what a lot of times will happen in, in people's lives? They'll get all of those things mixed up. You'll find pastor after pastor after pastor uh, that will put everything in front of their family and eventually what will happen. But here we find that this service that he had was, was to Christ. That, that's absolute number one. Was to the church, but it was also to his family. How do we serve in those aspects? How do we serve our Lord? How do we serve the church? How do we serve our family on a day-in, day-out basis? He was a man that, that lived in sacrifice. If you'll remember, uh, I believe it's John 3, around verse 14, I believe, uh, as he lived this life of sacrifice of Christ, he continually lived in that sacrifice. He did not get over the cross. I'm afraid for too many Christians, we've gotten over the cross. We've gotten over the fact that Christ loved us enough that he died on a cross for us and that he loved us even more so that he lives forevermore for us. We've forgotten that. We have became more like Laodicea in Corinth than we've came be like brother peter john 3 14 says just as the brazen serpent so too must the son of man be lifted up and all who look and believe shall be saved this life of sacrifice really it, it, it didn't hinder him it didn't shackle him but it made him to be able to live a life of liberty a life where he didn't have to worry about who he used to be a life that he didn't have to worry. And you really could go to Romans 6 and 7. He didn't have to worry about the flesh. All he had to worry about was living in the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Where do we, where do you have that problem of not being able to live in the sacrifice that Christ has made? A lot of times what happens is we, we get to a point where we just simply, uh, we get to a list. We got the acceptable list, we got the not acceptable list. We got the do's and we got the don'ts. And if you mess up on the do's or you mess up on the don'ts, then, then you're treated as anathema. You're treated as a heretic. When honestly, what we must do is live in the sacrifice 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to make a bold statement here, and I hope you don't have your tomatoes ready. But here's the bold statement. There is nothing that we can do that Christ cannot forgive. If you lived a life of sacrifice, which is, was in the love of Jesus Christ. If you'll remember uh, John 13, uh, 34, uh, Jesus says there, uh, the, Love one another as I have loved you, so should you love one another. This is the way they're going to know that you're mine, that you love one another. Oh, how often do we forget to love one another? But if we're going to live a life that is sacrificial, we must do it in love, not in duty. He was a man that lived in submission. Now, now, what do you mean by that, preacher? Well, uh, I remember I, I did a... a I about said funeral, but it was a wedding uh, for this couple. I'd known the boy since he was about two years old, and I watched him grow up. I'd known the girl since she was a teenager. So it was a very, it was very much a, a poetic thing that I was able to say, kiss your bride. But I remember in the midst of that, as we're going through the, uh, the counseling beforehand, she had a major problem with the word submit. Ladies, do, any, do you ever have a problem with that word? Be honest. You don't have to raise your hand, but be honest. I ain't going to submit to him. You see, we must all, all live a life that is submitted to the Lord. You see, we, we can say all day long, we can quote all the scripture we want, uh, we can, and can get in the best three-piece suit, or the best pantsuit, or the best dress, we can uh, fix our hair the best way we can unless you're me, or whatever the course may be. But if we're not living a life that is submitted to our king, then our life is for naught. Jesus said, there will be many that come to me on that day. Talking about judgment. On that day, they will say, uh, Lord, I did this for you. I did this for you. I did this for you. If you look at that list, that, uh, he, he, it says you know, that he, they, spoke, they spoke the gospel. Okay. Do you think every person that speaks the gospel was ever, uh, was ever saved? Uh, I don't know. But I can tell you that, that they spoke about him. Uh, that they, uh, they did many wonders. They cast out demons. Now, question. Now, if you're going to cast out demons, I want to say automatically I'm thinking that you're probably high up there on the list. Yeah, that, that, that person's got to be saved. If, if these demons will listen to them and they cast them out, they, they got to have Jesus. You see, if we're not living a life submitted to our king, is he really Lord? That can be shown in our lives. That is shown by our fruit. Jesus said, you will know them by their fruit. And we can go all day long and we can look at great things. We can look at uh, tremendous things. But if the fruit is bad, the fruit is bad. We can look the part and still not be the part if he's not Lord. He lived in submission to the will of God. If you remember, uh, I believe it's in uh, Acts 9, maybe 10. It's right in that area uh, where uh, he goes out and he's on this, uh, this top of a landing and he's taking a nap and all of a sudden the, the blanket comes down and there are all these, um, these animals that are unclean. I bet some of it was a slab of bacon. Even though they say it's unclean, you know that's got to be godly. But there it is, and the Lord says, eat. And he says, I'm not going to eat that. That's unclean. Then it happens again, and this time he gets it. 
what the Lord has made clean, who are you to call it unclean? There may be things in your life that you really don't want to do. There may be things in your life that you have regretted. But we must continue to stay in the will of God no matter what goes on in our lives. And in that, he had to be submitted to the very grace of God. I mean, look there in John uh, John 21. There he is that he thinks that he's done. He's gone. He's a goner. There's nothing more he can do. Uh, but yet what happens? The grace of God shows up. Where in your life right now do you need the grace of God to show up? Remember a song, Grace, Grace, God's Grace. Peter was an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, you look at that word, that word, uh, I'm not even going to try to say it, but it means to be an ambassador of Christ. Now, to be an ambassador, of Christ, uh, an ambassador of Christ means that he was a representative to of Christ to others. Guess what you and I are? We are to be an ambassador to Christ. We are to represent God to other people. I was talking. I had to go by this past week uh, to a parts store to uh, get a few things. Christy had a uh, blown headlamp and in the uh, car, and I, I just needed to change out the windshield wipers. So I go to one of the stores, and I get there, and I, I'm talking to this uh, this man that uh, that's checking me out, and as I'm talking to him, found out that uh, he didn't go to church anywhere. So then we began to start the witnessing uh, process, and I'll be honest, uh, in talking with this man, uh, this one is going to be the one that, that I write down on the sheet of paper on Sunday morning. But you see, we must be a representative of Christ. Now, I guarantee there have been many times that you and I have failed to be an accurate, faithful representative of Christ. But that does not mean that we get to stop. An apostle means that he's a messenger. And as a messenger, that meant that he went out and told everybody about his king. Jesus is Lord, by the way. Did you know that? We can say that all day long, but do we live that? Do we tell others that? Do we show that in an everyday situation? And here's another one. Guess what? We must even show it inside our homes. He was set apart. To be set apart literally means that he was different. He was different. He had a special purpose. And he was to be conformed to the image of God. Can I tell you how you know what God you serve? If Whatever God you serve, you will begin to mimic. If you don't believe me, go read Romans chapter 12. As we are transformed. Why? Because he's our God. Well, if he's not our God and something else is our God, then that's what we're going to do. I remember I used to be able to tell you about any, any and every stat you wanted of, a, of a college football. I, I love college football. I'll admit that. Uh, but at the same time, that could become a God if I let that take precedence over God. I've known many a people over the years that they can tell you each and everything about one individual thing, but you ask them anything about the Bible, anything about the church, anything about Christ, and they begin to clam up. Because they're not being conformed to the image of God. They were being conformed to the image of their God. Charles Stanley put it this way, as I was reading earlier. Uh, Charles Stanley said this set apart means that we are sanctified. This sanctification is a process. It's a progressive 
sanctification. In other words, we, we're going to be better today than we were yesterday. But is that always true? So we'll look at this last part and we'll be done. To the pilgrims of the dispersion, I'm not going to go through those names again. They are uh, places in Turkey, and I, I could geek out and give you that for an hour. I'm not going to because it really has nothing to do here other than these are the same people that were there when he began to preach on uh, in Acts chapter 2. But as we look at this, we find pilgrims. Well, pilgrims are strangers in a strange land. Guess what? If you are a child of God, you are right now a stranger in a strange land. This world is not your home. You are simply traveling through. Moses put it this way via God about Abraham. He called Abraham a sojourner. That meant he, that he was there, but that wasn't where he belonged. Right now, we got to ask the question, where do we need to realize that we're just a sojourner? We're a pilgrim. What things in our lives have we grabbed a hold of that we think are important, which really they're not? If you look at the word pilgrim, I'm going to try to say this one because it's very important. It says, parapidemos, parapidemos. And really, as we look at that, the first four word, uh, letters of the word uh, are their own word, if you really want to say it. They're, it's the word para. In today's uh, education, the, there's a thing called a para. Uh, it's what we used to call a teacher's aid. Well, what does a teacher's aide or a para do? They come in proximity to the person that they're working for or with, and they do the job that they're called to do. Isn't that a good explanation of what we are to be? We are draw near to the Lord. By the way, he would draw near to us. And we are to do what he has called us to do. We are pilgrims of the dispersion, dispora. Now, in looking at this, it, it really has two meanings. Number one, it means the scattering. The scattering means that, that they're, they're scattered out. They're not where they're supposed to be any longer. I think that could explain all of us. We're not where we're supposed to be. But one day we'll get there. But that scattering came in this context because of what happened uh, after Stephen was, uh, was persecuted and died. There was this guy that was carrying the coats. His name was uh, Saul. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He, uh, to be a Pharisee, by the way, he had to be married. So that takes care of that question. Uh, and, and so in that he got letters to go to the different cities to arrest, beat, and kill Christians. So guess what the Christians did? What Jesus told them to do in Acts chapter 1. They spread out. They spread out because they had been converted. So this letter is not just to the Jews. This letter is to the church. This letter is to you. Shall we realize the simple fact that everything that we go through, we are simply nothing but pilgrims? So I'll ask this question as I finish up. Where are you on your pilgrimage? Where are you? on this road that we call life. See, from Sunday, the road has been prepared for you. Christ paved the way. He gave you the opportunity. He has called you unto himself. 
And in this, we got to look at each and every day, where am I in my pilgrimage in this life? Am I living a life that is pleasing unto the Lord, or am I living a life pleasing to myself? Am I living a life that is pleasing unto God, or am I living a life pleasing to my gods? That will dictate the rest of our lives. Let us pray. Dear Lord, most gracious Heavenly Fathers, we come before you right now. Father, I just want to thank you, praise you, and Father, simply want to honor you. Lord, right now, as we've looked at Brother Peter, those places in our lives where we are not submitted to, Father, show those to us and find us saying yes to you. There's places in our lives where we are not serving you and serving your bride. Show us those things and find us saying yes to you. Father, as we begin this study, I just simply ask that you will continually over and over and over again remind us that this is not our home we're just traveling through it's your name I ask and humbly pray amen all right